It's always been a tough road off the bat, but the crazy exploit I'm about to drop on you will flip the script for anyone moving forward. And it all starts insanely close to Copeland's compound, as you can see on the map, where you ride out to this little pond and take notice of that rock. As many of you know by now, the bike plays an extremely important role in the game and is about as close as a companion to Deke as Boozer is. And that's how we take this journey to another level. To bust the game, we have to be unconventional. And this is how we accomplish that. We just go to that part of the rock and use Deke's legs of steel to power himself and the bike up and over. And this is about as off-road as it gets. Now, you don't have to take the high road here that I'm taking. There is a lower area that you can ride along, but I just wanted to show that the game still has boundaries and it'll let you know when you get close to them. The good thing is we can skirt that line and still get back to a usable area to travel on without the game cutting us out or returning us to a starting waypoint or whatnot. You just have to follow the ridge line and this mound in the middle of the ridge to take our path and leave the cascades. Literally when you just get the bike, you Manny just gave it to you and within moments, once you've reached that area, that pond and that rock, and you travel along this route, you've now hit the Lost Lake region. Now, you're not in the Lost Lake area yet. We still have a little ways to go because we have to cross the whole mountain range. The game just let us know that now it considers us in the Lost Lake region. So Cascades is behind us and all you have to do is follow this general route up these hills to this peak where the tree is. Really just a sightseeing Take note of the fact that Lost Lake is within reach now. Of course, this is just the start because not only will Lost Lake be accessible, but we will be going to all the regions of the map using essentially the same strategy that we just did to get Deke to this point. While the mission of this video is to grab some pretty potent weapons to amp up Deke's arsenal, I'm pretty sure many dozens of hours of exploration are in your future. Obviously the mountain range is vast since it separates the Cascade Belknap from Lost Lake and Iron Butte. But once you spot that floating grass, you just kind of head left because our entry point into the Lost Lake region is past this outcropping of rocks on the left, that driftwood, and these clump of trees. And then we're gonna hit a rock ledge and we wanna make it up those rocks just enough because this is our entry point into Lost Lake. And seeing as we're not going down the rocks but are traveling on an invisible shelf, I can pretty much guarantee that we're not going to be getting back to the Cascades in the same way. So make sure Deke and the bike are in good shape, because here we go. Now because this is the first time we're dropping off a ledge with any significant height, this pop-up will appear just to let you know the kind of damage you're about to take, and a little bit of how you can avoid some of it. Unfortunately, we fell from like a million feet, so the bike will be damaged. There's no way around that, and we're gonna stop at some point and fix it up. Taking a look around, you can see that the roads are here, the ground, the trees. There are some freakers on the road ahead of us, so the devs have completed the game. So even though early game, the barriers are there to pretty much 
take you along the story in a linear progression. We've just totally blown that wide open now. Now you're free to roam everywhere. Now also, realistically, we're in spoiler territory now as well, because you're accessing a region you shouldn't even be aware of yet, and because when you're on map view, the map cursor, the cursor that you use, won't even let you move the cursor beyond the mountain range. So, be aware. If you do decide it's your one of your first playthroughs on an easier setting just to get a lay of the land, you're going to run into things that you may not want to necessarily know about if you're interested in playing the game as it was intended. This is definitely not how it was intended. Okay. I can fix this. Just go. taking a little bit of time to repair the bike from our massive drop off a cliff and also taking some time to refuel because with the gas tank that we have we're gonna need it a lot while there are actually three access points from Lost Lake into Iron Butte we've chosen this one specifically for that rock face because we are once again going to use Deke's legs of steel to power our way up that rock face and gain access to the Iron Butte region. This is also a perfect opportunity to make a quick save of your progress so far, and pretty advisable to do so when you've reached certain waypoints or it's actually calm enough to repair and refuel the bike. Now you can see here that when you actually enter map mode, it will center on Deke's location, and you can actually zoom in and out as you'll see a bit later, you can also move it left or right, but the moment you try moving it up or down to try and show further north or further south, because of where we are in the game so early on, it'll just snap back to only showing the portion of the map that you're normally supposed to have access to during the main story playthrough. Alright, time to move on and get over to the Iron Butte region to pick up our weapons. Just take note of the line that I'm taking here up the rock face to get onto this outcropping because this is a two-stage process to get into Iron Butte. Successfully accomplishing that first phase, again, we just have to walk up the rock face and hit this one at a particular angle and put Deke's mighty legs of steel to good use to power up our way up onto that ledge. Making it here, we've now gained access to the Iron Butte region, and we're on our way to acquire the two weapons that are located here. Good idea to keep track of freakers that are near you, especially when you're traveling at low speed. If they're too close, they'll jump, and they'll knock you off your bike, and then You'll be in a world of hurt, especially with the weapons that D currently has, which we are going to upgrade as we ride through the region to a very specific spot near a horde that most of you will be familiar with. Now acquiring this first weapon will actually be a breeze. It's just the tediousness of riding the bike all the way over there because it's in a very open spot, just waiting to be claimed. Not gonna have any difficulty picking this up, unless we're careless enough to agitate the horde and get them chasing us. Probably not a good idea with the loadout that we currently have, and I don't intend on doing that. We're just gonna park the bike so that we can make a quick escape if we run into trouble. But here we go. So we are now at the Iron Butte Horde. And even this early in the game, they've spawned in. So feel free to take them on at your peril. <laughs> but here we are. This primary weapon, the US 556, is an amazing piece of hardware to have early game. Considering that you would normally have to be at level 3 trust at Tucker's camp 
to be able to purchase it. So one down and one to go in this region. The next weapon is going to be a little tougher to negotiate away from the person that's holding it. But considering we just upgraded with this weapon, we should have a little bit of an easier time. Now my aim sucks, so it might not be that easy. Just another quick look here at the path we've taken to get to the Iron Butte Horde to pick up our weapon. And just going to skip ahead a little bit as we approach the location of our second weapon that will be in the hands of a Ripper. So we're going to have to pry it out of his cold dead hands. Ah, Freakers. You know, probably would have been a better idea to do this at daytime rather than being impatient as I was and wanting to do this at night because the freakers they're just all over the place and they're gonna impede our progress i'll hold still long enough and i'll eventually get a headshot unfortunately all that gunfire is just going to bring them down harder and faster. Not to mention bringing up even more rippers and getting myself into trouble with them possibly flanking me up at this location, which is just above a tunnel with a Nero checkpoint at the front of it. And now I have to run. One small consolation, though, in one sense is that because the gunfire draws the freakers I'm not the only one shooting the rippers are also shooting at me <laughs> and, they're, and they're also gonna go after wherever the sound is coming from so it's a kind of double-edged sword this strategy playing at night well, wonder if there's anything in that here's a good here's a good result Freakers and Rippers fighting each other, which is good. All right. Oh, caught a glimpse just to the left of that rock of our target. Rippers heavily armored. So we're going to have to soften him up a bit before we can take the weapon away from him. Yeah, I would love to throw a Molotov. Fortunately, he didn't see me, but he is alerted now, so... And that weapon is devastating. Only a couple of shots, a couple of direct hits, and we're in trouble. Oh, there we go. Time to run. Yeah, lay into them. <laughs> One of the uh, best things about not being liked by marauders and rippers is that they'll come after you. Same way the freakers will come after you. It's too bad I can't recruit the freakers, though. Right on target. There should be some provision in the game where D could probably have like a knapsack or something that he can carry slabs of meat with him so he can just throw them at the freakers <laughs> as payment. <laughs> I think if you're playing this relatively new, you might want to change your strategy and play it in the daytime. Just less chance of being flanked by rippers attacking you from the front and freakers sneaking up on you from behind and talking about being snuck up on here's a strategy you might want to think about by going into photo mode which you can do at any point in the game you don't have to be at a particular position or in a situation but you can use the camera to swivel around the area and with that shot change that you just saw right there, that little fade, 
if an enemy is close enough to you, you can actually have the camera view the situation from their vantage point. So what happened is the heavy on that ledge was out of my sight, couldn't see him, but I was able to switch the camera to find out where he was. It only works on enemies that are a certain distance from you, so you can't just see everybody around you. But in a situation like that, where there's a lot of obstacles that maybe can impede your view, or you are at a high position and you just want to get a lay of the land, going into photo mode is definitely advantageous in a situation like this. Ah, more freakers. Yeah, I highly advise that you do this during the daytime. Uh, another tactic you can use is wait until they're just about to lunge and then you can basically dive roll away from them yeah the hell with it <laughs> it's not like being silent is going to help the situation any I think at this point I've dealt with more freakers than actual rippers. Just got tired from watching that. Yeah, so the boot knife is definitely indestructible, but it takes a lot of effort just to kill one freaker. Fortunately, there was only the one that I had to deal with at that moment. But you'll see in a bit why the best melee weapon in the game, which is yet to come, and not found in Iron Butte. No, sir, we're going to have to travel through one more region in order to get that weapon. But right now, we're just going to deal with getting the gun off that dead heavy. Ripper's, I guess, manifest destiny to the world. Fortunately, the sounds coming from that speaker are attracting freakers to it and keeping some of them off my back. I'll take that. I'll take that as a win. got really quiet around that Nero checkpoint, so I'm going to just check things out again. Always a little wary when I hear a freaker screaming or chomping at the bit, if you will. But let's just shoot into camera mode one more time, just to get a lay of the land. Oh, and looky there. What can we see there? I think... Is our Ripper heavy down? <laughs> okay! Now I feel like I should have some sort of reward for the Freaker. Of course, I'm sure taking a... Pipe bomb to the face didn't help. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Let's go down and get it. Ah, damn it. Ugh, where the hell are you? Can't see nothing. Yeah, I seek the path, all right. Just patch ourselves up a little bit. Stay behind the cover. And wait for our opportunity. Come on. Poke your head out. Oh. 
Well, I think our Freaker recruit there is helping us out. Yep. Good job. Of course, now I gotta take care of the Freaker. But the good thing is, they just run and claw at you. They don't actually shoot at you, so that's always a bonus. Oh, not bad with the crossbow. I wonder if I should use that more often. Okay, Just are we done now? Jeez. A lot of effort to go after this gun, but I have to tell you, it will make a big difference moving the game forward, especially when we get back to the Cascades and actually start going through... Yeah, just... <laughs> Not sure if I'm going to get ambushed, so I'll take uh, a quick gander with binoculars, even though I'm like 10 feet away. But there we are. That's it. We're exchanging this lethal little baby for something that is arguably more silent. And once you acquire certain recipes to craft different kinds of arrows, gives you a little bit more in the way of options rather than this heavy gun but it all depends on your gameplay whether you like to be locked and loaded in a situation or prefer a more stealthy and silent approach now one big caveat of the plan that we've put in place here to nab these weapons out in the world is that they will not show up in your locker. It's a game mechanic that I kind of wish was different, but only purchased weapons will show up in your locker. Therefore, make sure that whatever weapon you happen to find out in the open that you decide to keep, you have to keep it on your person. You drop them, you can pick them back up again, but if you drop them and leave them behind, you will have to wait for another opportunity to look for them in the world or in the end end up purchasing them if you want to keep it. Which isn't to say that what we've accomplished so far isn't going to be a big help when we start following the main story again. These weapons are far more devastating than the initial loadout that Deeks provided with. The crossbow, the 9mm, and not even a primary weapon. Didn't even have that. Alright. One last item on the agenda to pick up. And that will be heading over to yet another region. This time Crater Lake. To pick up a melee weapon with essentially the best stats in the game. The two stats of durability and damage are maxed out on this melee weapon. And that's where we're going now. Off in the distance there is the black smoke indicating an ambush camp. And that's where we're headed. Because that camp will essentially be part of the last leg of our journey. How many drifters you guys murder today? Oh. Huh? Yeah. Someone's <laughs> Sorry, man. Deke's on a mission. We are not stopping for anything. Now that laser light there would normally be something I'd be worried about. I don't care. We're moving on ahead. Small spoiler alert for the first timers. This camp in the main game is usually populated by rippers, but not at this point. And if you haven't surmised by now, guess where we're going? Yep, another rock face. Just getting good old legs of steel deacon up these particular crevices. Yeah. 
sometimes going forward doesn't always work, so it's also worth trying to go backwards up an incline. For some reason, there are certain instances where that actually works better than going forward. It's a bit of a mystery as to why that is, but I'll take any advantage I can get. And just like that, we're moving on from Iron Butte and heading to Crater Lake. Now again, I'm showing an optimized path through the territory without skirting too many of the paths to oblivion, if you will, or the paths that will eventually tell us we're leaving the gameplay area. This one is a little bit more forgiving. And as you can see, the mountain range is pretty vast space to cross, but there's the Iron Butte, and way in the distance are the Cascades, leaving those behind and entering the third and final region of the game. And as you just saw, entering map mode, which was centered on Deke, no problem. But the moment we tried to go north or south, it clipped back to only the Cascade region and Belknap. Now this is what I mean by a path to oblivion. Anytime you come across textures that look kind of whack compared to the terrain that you're riding on, usually delineates the boundary between one section and another. It'll be pretty prominent as we come up to this rock face here. I have a feeling that the game only renders itself where Deke is, so until he's crossed that threshold, the game just decides, ah, he's not over here, I'm not gonna bother. But once you cross it, everything just renders in. And there you go, there's Wizard Island on the left and Diamond Lake on the right. And now we have one last obstacle to cross, one threshold to cross here. Just follow this path that I'm leading you down. And if you've already guessed by now, the boundary between the regions is defined by invisible cliffs. Shit, engine crapped out. Yeah, well, at least we didn't die. Let's see. I've had it Let where Deke falls off the bike and, well, smashes his head against the ground. Of course he's going to die. He might have legs of steel, but... He's still mortal and is vulnerable to impact damage. Regardless of the fact, we are headed to pick up the best melee weapon in the game. And in this particular part of the world near Diamond Lake, there are actually two locations where you can pick up this weapon. One is actually a lot closer to the Diamond Lake encampment, but the reason I choose this location is twofold. One, to get the weapon pretty close to where we dropped in, and the other is always keeping in mind our need for fuel. Which in this case is hiding inside this cabin. Now I can hear you muttering to yourself, yeah, but Grey Ghost, just head over to the encampment and fuel up and repair your bike there. Unfortunately, while the devs did an amazing job building out the world, we're not supposed to be here. So there are a few things that haven't quite spawned in yet because they won't come into play until way later in the game anyway. I don't know if it has to do with saving memory or they just didn't feel like spawning them in. Because as you can see, a lot of things are built up. You've got the environments, you've got the freakers, you've got marauders, you've got rippers. So there are certain aspects that are all built out. But going to the encampments, there are two major things missing. You can't turn bounties into anybody, and you can't go to the kitchen and turn in meat or any of the herbs that you've collected. Which means camp credits aren't available yet. Before I 
talk too much further on that point. Just take note of this little pop-up that lets us know a horde can be nearby. In fact, this, oh, if we just look over to Cliff Edge, you can see that there's a horde feeding ground right there. But that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in that. I've frozen the video just so we could take a look at the damage and durability statistics. And it's plain to see that they are just maxed out. This is the best melee weapon in the game, bar none. And with that, we've managed to replace all the crappy weapons that Deke had in his initial loadout and have replaced them with far superior weaponry that will make dealing with the story points in the Cascade and Belknap regions a whole lot easier to deal with. Gotta admit that this has been quite the ambitious plan to travel to all these regions using Deke's legs of steel to power his way up all those rock faces which would probably cripple most ordinary men. Definitely taking his vitamins and eating his spinach like a good boy. Alright, we've pretty much accomplished what we've set out to do in this video. Now it's just time to show you the way back through all these regions and essentially come full circle by returning to our starting point at Copeland's camp. This leg of the journey is probably the longest one from where we entered the region to where we have to go to actually get back into the Lost Lake region to then return back to the Cascades. And there's Wizard Island in the distance. We're not stopping. I'm bypassing that whole area because I have no money to exchange with the good folks over there. And just as a quick spoiler, at Wizard Island, the mechanic is there, but also incredibly, the weapon merchant is there. So you could technically refill your ammo once you've acquired some cash, which is definitely possible to do, regardless of the fact that there aren't any main story missions that you can take on while you're doing this really early exploration. But as you've seen, a lot of the area has been filled out and there are still marauders and camps. As you can see on the left, there's smoke indicating a camp that can be attacked. With the exception of the Ripper camp that we used to get our way into the Crater Lake region, most ambush camps are populated and are available to earn trust and gain credits. That particular one that I just showed is actually another camp that you can acquire the MG45 from. So if you're having trouble with the Ripper camp and dealing with those guys, squatters. You're the assholes who tried to ambush me. you can actually come to this camp where there is also a marauder that has the MG45 to be able to take from. Always a good spot to make a save once you've made significant progress through a region. Always a good habit to have. But what I wanted to really show in particular is once we rode up close enough, the map now indicates that there's an ambush camp available. So just another reason to do more exploring because it is filled out. There are a lot of things to do in the region, regardless of the fact that missions won't be available for a while. Because this is day 736. We're not supposed to be here. And it just goes to show how thought out the game actually is and how much is available beyond just following the normal story progression. So right by this ambush camp is actually a, 
one of my favorite areas to stock up on a lot of things because there's a fire truck, there's two cop cars, there's an ambulance, so you can take advantage of the fact other than realizing that once you access tins from the cop cars, they will not respawn. But looking at the indicator on the screen, notice how it replenished the supply of the weapons that I had? All tins are quite adaptive to know what it is that you're carrying. So the tins will always resupply the weapon that you have on hand, regardless of where in the world they are. Whenever you come across one of those tins, either in a cop car or out in the open, like we found in the cabin when we got the gas can, when we first arrived at Crater Lake, the tins will adapt to the weapons that you're carrying. So that's another good little tip to keep in mind. So, again, if you were to take out that infestation zone, if you were to take out the ambush camp, you'd actually gain some trust and gain some credits in the region. I wouldn't be surprised if you could just go to every region and take care of everything. Of course, that would be another video to investigate whether by doing so, will the game progression interfere with that? So. If you've done all this stuff before you're supposed to in the game, when the story point actually gets to that point of the game, will you have the credits there? Will you have the trust? Something to think about. Ah, good old marauders. We will not engage with them. With the weapons we have, I doubt it would be very difficult to take care of any of these situations, but again, not the point I'm trying to make here. I'm just trying to say, hey, look at where we are. We're literally receiving the bike from Manny off the rack, hot off the press, and we've managed to cover every region in this world. Grab ourselves some great weapons, so that when we get back into story mode and start dealing with main missions and side quests and camp jobs, they should all fundamentally go a whole lot easier than the way the game originally intended with Deke and his crappy little weapons. We're pretty close now to the edge of the map on the eastern side of the entire region because just at the entrance of that horde cave is our way out. In the same way that until you get to certain regions certain hordes will spawn or won't spawn, at this point of the game this horde does not spawn in. So you can park there and just taking a look at our path through the region once we got the axe and how we traveled through Iron Butte to be able to pick up the MG45 and the US 556 and once again Deke's legs of steel power our way up the rock face have a little bit of trouble there but you got to get the bike into that nook to be able to climb up and over. Now if you're thinking ahead you'll come to realize that actually just climbing up the rock face part way next to a horde cave might actually just end up giving you a huge advantage when you have to come to deal with them later on in the game when they spawn in. Just something to take note of. No, I'm not bowing, but <laughs> I just didn't realize I don't have any scrap left to be able to fix the bike. And that's why the 
circle icon is not appearing. I only realized that when I went to the other side of the bike. It's like, how come I can't fix anything? Oh yeah, I don't have any scrap, so scrap that idea. Anyway, we take a straight line, just pass to the right of that rock and immediately hang a left. Because if you continue forward, you'll crash into an invisible wall. And we head toward these pines, this group of pines, head right through them, continue forward in kind of a northerly direction since we have to head away from Crater Lake. And I sometimes use that chairlift pylon that we just passed as a marker to let me know that, okay, I'm heading in the right direction. And like what occurred when we entered the region, as we see Lost Lake, what a beautiful vista. Oregon is an amazing place. Take a look at that snow on the right. It literally is the dividing line between Lost Lake and Crater Lake regions. Incredible vista. Sorry, I just wanted to pan the shot just to take a look at that amazing scenery. Unlike where we crossed over the first time to get into the Crater Lake region, uh, there is essentially no substantive terrain under that snow. You're free to experiment and try to cross it. If you had nitrous, maybe later you can come back with nitrous and take a few runs at it, but I found that if you want to avoid oblivion, it's just a lot easier to just coast down this ridge line, take note of where the snow, the terrain is stable, cross over at that tree just heading right, and as the game just told us, we're now back in the Lost Lake region. Still have one more obstacle to uh, uh, overcome, and we just head left of that rock formation through these two trees because it just takes us down to a couple of Nest. ledges, real <sighs> ones this time, right. not invisible oh, ones, make it safer to ride that here. will do at least a little bit less damage than if we just yeet it off the side. I intend to use the rock edge I just showed to back the bike down it and not sustain too much damage to be able to land on top of the tunnel entrance. And as we can see, this map shows us the infestation zones that Deke encountered. There's the ambush camp. And essentially that's the speed run route through Iron Butte, Crater Lake, and then planning our way back to Copeland's camp. Eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that that particular graphic showed fast travel? Is that possible? Well, let's just see if I make it down. Yikes! Yeah, this is not gonna go well. <laughs> Normally I would do better than that, but that's okay. The bike is still drivable, even though we have nothing to repair it with, so we got a little lucky there. But we got the infestation zone freakers to just kind of congregate underneath us, and that opened up the way for us to get out of here. Poor son of a bitch. Bet you had that coming, though, yeah? All right. Now we're out of here, heading back to Lost Lake. Yeah, Deke, you do that. Come back later. Get some credits. Get some trust. So back to the point of fast traveling. You can imagine one of the obstacles to fast travel are infestation zones. Imagine what would happen if you took the time to clear those out and you're playing on a difficulty level that will allow you to fast travel. Some possibilities there. Now, I'm curious about the Sawmill Horde. We are literally at the start of the game. And I want to know, 
Just for my own curiosity, are they there? Have they spawned in? I can see some movement over there. <laughs> and I can hear them. Oh yeah. Oh, it's tempting with the MG45, but there are 500 of those puppies. And I still have a little ways to go before I attempt to take those guys on. So we'll come back to that. Now I just want to show since we didn't stop off at Wizard Island, but I told you that the mechanic and the weapons, the weapons officer is there. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little Star Trek thing. I, I like that. So, so we're gonna find out what we have here at Lost Lake. And if my suspicions are correct, not a lot. Yeah. Nobody there. And there was nobody at the bounty counter either. Only the mechanic is here. But since we have no money, no trust, no nothing, we can't refuel or repair. So we're a little bit up a creek. But that's okay. Because there's a gas station not too far from here. And I think we'll be able to manage even though it's at 16%. I'm actually taking a pretty big risk here thinking that I can make it to that gas station before I run out trying to coast, but you do not want to move slow near a Freaker. They will attack you and knock you off the bike. So here's hoping. Cross your fingers, everybody. Just trying to use enough engine power to get over. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta help? I don't think so. Oh boy. Yeah. Wow. Uh oh, I should stop for fuel. Yeah, I should stop for fuel. We just literally ran out. But I have a bad feeling about this. Son of a bitch. Oh man. Oh, well, jeez, I just missed avoid getting killed there. That's okay. We have the US556, so we'll just patch up and take care of these boys. And girl. Yeah, I wonder if that poor soul is dead, probably. Don't know. Well, time to finish up what we started. Which was to nab some fuel here. <laughs> and now the big finale question. How do we get back from Lost Lake to the Cascades after traveling all that way? We can't go up sheer cliffs anymore. But to be honest, it's actually really simple. So here we are at our fuel depot and all we're really going to have to do is drive across. Yep. No rock climbing, no legs of steel required. We literally just have to get on the bike now that we're fueled up. Still damaged. I probably could have looked for scrap around here, but we're in good shape. And we're literally just going to ride back into the Cascade region. 
another nest zone. I gotta burn this shit down and make it safer. Here's the roadway that later on in the game, as you most of you know, you ride into the region when we're ready to take Boozer out of the Cascades. And this is how you get back into the Cascades. Just ride in the reverse. Because what's going to happen is, once you get to the threshold where you cross over at those two pines on the right, the game's going to take over. And after a brief load, you'll find yourself deposited right at the entrance of the dirt road leading into Lost Lake. Folks, I'm so excited to hear what adventures you're going to open up for yourself, so please drop some comments and let me know how it goes. Do hit that subscribe button if your mind's been blown, and I encourage you to share the hell out of this to every Days Gone player you can. Thanks for popping by and giving me your time, and I'll catch you in the next one. Be good to yourselves and those you meet out there.